but um, praise God that we're in the house of the Lord. And today is Wednesday. In two days' time, it is Good Friday. And you know, as I was just um, meditating on what to open with tonight, you know, two days before Jesus went to the cross, some people call that Spy Wednesday, but Jesus was in Simon the leper's house. Any other world leader would be on a big stage out bringing crowds to himself, taking glory for himself. But Jesus' heart was towards the leper. And you know, there was a lady in that house as well. And she was being judged and scoffed at for anointing Jesus' head with oil, with an expensive fragrant oil. But you know, in the midst of that, in the midst of her persecution, she persisted and she anointed him in worship. You know, and it's just... Um, the others around, they've totally missed the point. But you know, it's tonight, if you're that leper, or you're, if you're that woman, whether you're being persecuted, if you're going through a time of distress, or whether it's because of your own sin, you know, just push through it because Jesus is there. He is waiting. We can come to his feet. We can worship him. You know, let's just stand now as before we come into worship. And just in Mark 14, verse 8 to 9, she has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, whenever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be a memorial to her. Come meet with Jesus in worship. His heart is towards you. He went to the cross with you in mind. She understood that Jesus chose us over himself. So let's enter in with that fragrant oil of worship right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God. Like that lady, Lord, with a thankful heart, she understood, God, the price you were going to pay, God. She understood how you put us first, God, and we didn't deserve it, Lord. She understood her lowly place and her sin, God, but she gave what everything she had, the most expensive thing she had, and she sacrificed it unto you, God. Like that woman, God, we worship you now, Jesus. Lord we sit at your feet God we understand that your heart is towards the leper it's towards the downtrodden God Lord and Lord we're just celebrating this week God remembering how you went to the cross for us God and we just worship you we want to anoint your head with oil God Lord we just want to bring you this fragrance or give it back to you in a thankful heart God Lord have your place God in our lives Lord in this world God take your power and your glory Jesus we lift you up in Jesus name
All my plans, all my heart, everything to you. I surrender everything to you.
and you are so faithful, God. And so, Lord, we're taking tonight, God, to look to you, Jesus. We're looking to you tonight, God. We're looking to you, God, and to the cross and what you've done for us, God, and what you've given us, God, through the cross, Jesus. And so, Lord, we praise you tonight, God. You deserve all the honor, God. You deserve all the honor, God, all the praise, God. You're worthy of it all, Jesus. You're worthy of it all, Jesus. And so we give you praise, God. We give you glory tonight, God. You deserve everything. God, you've given us everything through your son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being so good to us, God. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for redeeming us, God. Thank you for being faithful to us, even if we're not faithful to you, God. You are good to your children, God. That you are the very essence of good, God. It's in your character, Lord. And so, Lord, we know that whatever we're going through, God, whatever's going on in our world, Lord, that we can, we can trust that you are good because it's in your character, God. Lord, it's fixed. It's absolute. It can't change, God. And so, Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you, God, that we can come to you tonight, God. We can surrender everything to you because we are in your good hands, God. So thank you. We praise you, God. We give you all the praise, God. We give you all the praise tonight, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 
Good evening, everybody. Thank you, worship team. As you take a seat, why don't you greet somebody next to you? Thank you. All right. There could be more of this fellowship afterwards, of course. Um, before we get into the announcements, I'm going to see if anybody um, needs an envelope to give tonight. If you can go ahead and raise your hands, there'll be ushers coming around with an envelope. Um, but if you're also wanting to give um, electronically, there is a way in the red carpet area, so you're welcome to do that. Um, and before we get into the announcements, I'll go ahead and pray for the tithes and offerings. Um, actually, before that, I want to see, if, is there anybody, any newcomers here tonight? Is this your first time joining us tonight? Raise your hand. If the, Yes, right here. Yes, in the back. Can we give you a clap? Yes, we're so glad you're here. You're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, there, there, yes, there you go. A connect card. I spoke and it appeared. Very weird. Yes, no, that's great. We're so happy that you're here and welcome again to all of our um, regular comers, um, Cork Church um, family. We are happy that you're here. But I'm going to go ahead and pray for the tithes and offerings, and then we will um, get into the announcements. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, again for just the beautiful presence, God, um, that we get to be in, God. And uh, it's just such a privilege, Lord, that you want to be amongst your people, God, that you're not just a far away, up in the sky kind of God, but you're also personal and you're close and you're intimate, God. And that you're our father and you're our friend, God, and you care for us, Lord. And you love to spend time with your children, God. And so, Lord, thank you for that, Lord. And, Lord, as we come around giving tonight, God, we just want to put a, we just, we just want to uh, pray over it. We want to bless it, God. We want it to multiply, God. We want it to continue to bless this church, the community, um, and also just around the country and the world, God. It's such a privilege and a blessing, God, to see what you're doing here in Cork through the food bank and through the ministries here in the church, but also what you're doing nationally and around the world, God. We're just so privileged, God, to be a part. So, Lord, we just want to pray over the giving, God, as it continues to grow the kingdom, God. Um, and so we pray a blessing over it and blessing over everyone giving. We praise you again tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. So quickly, we'll get through the announcements. Um, tomorrow is Thursday. So we do have lunch hour prayer. It's every Thursday, half 12 to half one. It is in person here in the sanctuary, um, but it's also online on our prayer life page or on our YouTube page. Um, and so you can even shoot in your prayer requests and it is, it is happening in real time. And so um, we'll pray for them as they come through. Um, and then also on Thursday evenings, we have our Portuguese service. Um, that's at 7.30, and it's actually up here in the sanctuary. Can we praise God for what he's doing in our Portuguese ministry? Yes, incredible. So it'll be up here on Thursday. Friday, this Friday is Good Friday, right? And so we are going to have a special breaking of the bread and prayer service this Friday. Um, it's going to be right here in the sanctuary. So please, if you're able to come, it's going to be from 12.30 to 1.30. Um, and if you're not able to make it in-house, we will be online as well, like the Prayer Life, uh, on Prayer Life page on Facebook or on our YouTube. Um, so please join us for that as we look back and remember what Christ's done on Good Friday um, to, for a breaking of bread and a prayer service. So that's Friday. Then also Friday evening, there's youth. So teenagers look on um, Instagram and all the things. They're giving me a thumbs up. They know this stuff. Um, so yes, yeah, Friday is youth. Um, and that brings us to Sunday, Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Yes, it's a great time. Yes, Resurrection Sunday, 11 a.m. here at the church. We are going to celebrate all that Christ has done, celebrate that he is alive. Um, and that, uh, so we want to celebrate that as a church family, but also invite somebody along. It's a great Sunday to invite somebody along um, to, to tell them what Christ has done for them and to give them the good news that Jesus is not dead, that he is alive. Um, so you want to not miss that. Um, and to not miss that, you also want to set your clocks forward an hour because it's daylight savings as well. I know we lose an hour of sleep, but that doesn't change. Easter is going to be great, right? Um, and then we, but we do have a pre-service prayer every Sunday at 10 a.m. as well. So if you want to come for that, and then young adults is actually off this week because it's Easter. So enjoy that time with your family, with your friends. Monday we have our prayer meeting on Zoom at seven o'clock. That brings us right back to next Wednesday, right here midweek at 7:15. I think I got everything down. 
So that's enough of me. I am delighted, though, to bring up our speaker tonight. Our Pastor Patrick is going to bring the word. Can we give him a clap as he comes up, welcomes him up? He's speaking to family tonight. Thanks, Jess. Good evening, Cork Church. It's all set up. I'm always so last minute with my notes. I have to enjoy the worship on a Wednesday from a copy machine. But it sounded awesome. Amen. Yeah, I miss it. I miss it every time I have to speak. But anyway, here we are. Come on, let's lift our hands. We're going to pray uh, before we get into the word tonight. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the richness of your grace. Lord, the mercy. Lord, the steadfast love. Lord, we are the richest of people, Lord, and we just pray, Lord, as we open up your word tonight, Lord, you would speak to our hearts. Jesus, we need you, and we want to see you clearly. Lord, we know it's your will to speak to your church, your bride, your body, and so I pray that you would use me to do that, Lord. Use me in my humanity, in my frailty, uh, because you are kind and gracious. I pray every head would be lifted in this place. Lord, I pray chains would be broken. Lord, I pray, Lord, people would see you as you are. Thank you so much for your loving kindness, O oh God. Bless this time around the word now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Folks, today uh, the title of the message is Hang Up Your Hang-Ups. Hang Up Your Hang-Ups. And um, I'm actually very proud of that. I'm very proud of that. Usually I can't even decide on one title, never mind one that has, you know, rhymy connotations. Anyway, uh, reading a Song of Solomon, right? And so we're going to be going, we're going to be living in chapter one really uh, for the majority of the reading. So I'm going to read um, from Song of Solomon and then I'm going to give a little context and we're going to dive in. Uh, let's go. The Song of the Song of Songs, which is Solomon, this is chapter one, Verse 1, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name uh, is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. Hallelujah. We will exult and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. I am very dark, but lovely. O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon, do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? Verse 8. If you do not know, O oh, most beautiful among women, follow in the tracks of the flock and pasture your young goats beside the shepherd's tents. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, uh, and your neck with strings of jewels. I'm going to move on to verse 15 here. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. And finally, chapter 2, verse 1. The Shulamite says, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for his reading tonight. Uh, so I'm going to give a little context, a little bit of an introduction uh, anybody who preaches knows the Song of Solomon is a tricky part of the Bible. So I had to ask the Holy Spirit a couple of times if that's where he wanted me to go from tonight, but I believe that it is. Uh, for anyone who's not fully aware, the Song of Solomon uh, is a principally a poem with two main characters. There is a Shulamite woman and there is a king who many commentators think is Solomon, King Solomon, who's also the author of the book. And I want to bring your attention to this, folks, at the beginning, because, and I'll just read this quote, there are those who treat this book as a song about human love. And there are those who consider its only value that of mystical suggestiveness. 
But personally, I believe that both values are here. So in other words, the chief speakers are not just Solomon and the Shulamite, but ultimately there's a higher understanding here, that it's a dialogue between Christ and the church. See, folks, the Song of Solomon can help us have a healthy view of sexuality and marriage. Okay, that's one reading. Yet, if that's all it's about, it actually has no place in the Scriptures. Psalm 40 verse 7 says this, Jesus says, or in the volume of the book, it's written of me. In other words, all Scripture speaks of Jesus. Amen? So this book contains shades of something higher, something more than just human sexuality. There is a greater love expressed here in this poem. Ephesians 5 verse 35, I'll read the Amplified. Paul says this, this mystery of two becoming one, that's marriage, is great, but I'm speaking with reference to the relationship of Christ and the church. Amen. So that's why I'm saying all of this, because that's how I want to lend this today. It's about Christ, and it's about the church. You see, folks, the Shulamite's journey is our journey. Her journey is our journey. It's the gospel story. It's the king's loving pursuit of a woman with no reputation and no status. That's me, that's you, that's the gospel, folks. From courtship all the way through to marital intimacy. What a picture tonight of the relationship of Christ and you and me. What a picture tonight of how he wins our hearts, how he pursues us and brings us ultimately into his chamber. And the point I want to make tonight is this, folks. The Shulamite, as we've read, she didn't stay outside the tent. The beginning of chapter 1 starts with her outside of the tent burdened with her insecurities. Her journey from courtship to the wedding to ultimately marriage was her journey out of insecurity into the love of her groom. And that is the very journey God wants to bring you and I on. Out of insecurity into the love that he has for us. That's the call to maturity, deepening in the love of God. You know, Augustine put it this way, how can you draw closer to God when you are far from yourself? How can you draw closer to God when you're far from yourself? Self-perception, folks, is a barrier. It is a barrier. And like the Shulamites, we all have our hang-ups. Amen? Any honest engines in the house tonight? Anybody can admit tonight, I've got my hang-ups. I want to define hang-ups this way. A hang-up is a preoccupation, a fixation, or a psychological block, a complex. The Scriptures would call it a um, stronghold. I want to talk to you tonight about our hang-ups, your hang-ups, my hang-ups, our shame, our negative self-perception. Because the way that we see ourselves can hidden dirt the way we perceive others. It can it's a problem. Amen? And if this is true in human relationships, how much more with God? How much more with God? And I want to ask you tonight, I want you to consider this. What are our hang-ups keeping us from seeing about Him? What are our hang-ups keeping us from experiencing in Him? So folks, we have to hang up our hang-ups by God's grace. Amen? So what we got to do because to fall in love with God is the greatest romance. Amen? To seek Him is the greatest adventure. And to find Him is the greatest human achievement. Amen? We're, we're, we're still we're ready for this. Praise the Lord. So look at the first couple of verses. She, in, between verses 1 and about 4, she expresses the desire that she has for Him. She expresses this understanding that she has for him. She wants to receive and experience the love she has for her beloved. Isn't that you and me? Isn't that us? We have a desire. We want to experience Christ. We, are, we desire intimacy. Amen. We are hardwired for it. We want to find our deepest satisfaction 
in relationship with the Lord. That's where we'll find it, in relationship with the Lord. Nothing else will do it. There is no human relationship that will satisfy that need for intimacy in you and I. It's only with Him, in Him, in relationship with Him. Scriptures say we desire the kisses of His mouth. It says here, Proverbs 24 verse 26 says that truth is like a kiss. So we desire His Word, if you like. Bible says that his love is better than wine. Charles Spurgeon uh, wrote 59 sermons on the Song of Solomon. And he said this, he said, the love of Christ is better than simply wine because of what is it, because firstly of what it's not. The love of Christ is totally safe and may be taken without question. You can't take too much. Amen. It doesn't cost anything. Taking more of it doesn't diminish the taste of it. It is totally without impurities, and it will never turn sour. It never produces ill effects. Amen. And the love of Christ is better than wine because of what it is. Like wine, the love of Christ has healing properties. Like wine, the love of Christ is associated with giving strength. Like wine, the love of Christ is a symbol of joy. And like wine, the love of Christ exhilarates the soul. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And when she said that his name was like perfume poured forth, she meant his character was as fragrant and as refreshing as cologne out of a bottle. I don't know if any of you men use cologne. If you don't, you should start. Women love it. Amen. Find your scent. Own it. You'll smell like the bottom floor of Debenhams. R.I.P. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And there's this wonderful call from the Shulamite to draw me close let me run after you. I, this, this has to come from you, Lord. Intimacy, a deeper relationship with you has got to come from you. And she rejoices over the truth that the king has brought her into his chamber. What a truth for you and I as Christians. That the king has brought us all the way in. That chamber was a unique place. Not everybody was getting in there. Amen. It's a sign of intimacy. It's a sign of the desire that God has for each and every one of us. Praise the Lord. She recognized it. And you know what, folks? To a level, we all have an objective re recognition, if you like. An understanding, a theory of God's love that we tend to operate with. We do. We know how to talk about it. We know how it applies to others. God loves the drunk on the street. God loves the addict. I think it was A.W. Tozer who said, Christians don't tell their lies. They just go to church and sing them. Amen. We love to sing our lies. When I was young, I used to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. I teach it to my children. I'm not sure I believe it all the time anymore. It's amazing. You see, because knowledge isn't enough. A theory isn't enough. A, a conception of the love of God is not enough. Because when it came time to receive that love for herself, she stumbled. Verse uh, 5 says this, I'm dark but lovely. Interesting that she would phrase herself, define herself that way. O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. And then she says this, do not gaze at me because I'm dark. Because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyards I have not kept. She stumbled when it was time to personally receive the love of God for herself. You know, they say the greatest journey is the 18-inch journey from the head to the heart. And she couldn't receive the love of God for herself. Dark but lovely. She led with her insecurities. That was her primary lens. She felt like a low-class laborer because of her exposure to the sun. And she revealed the source of her insecurity. Her mother's brothers had forced her to tend their vineyards and her own she hadn't kept. In other words, she'd poured herself out in abusive relationships. She'd given the best of herself at the expense of her own life. 
Can you identify with that? I've given my best years to people, to places, to things. And my own vineyard is nowhere. My own life is nowhere. My own, my, I, I've left the best of my years behind me. That's how she felt. My own vineyard I haven't kept. She couldn't receive his gaze because of her own insecurity. And most of us live, folks, if we're honest, with a dual awareness. We do. We live with, this, with an understanding of our flaws and our insecurities, our inadequacies, along with an awareness of who we are in him. I think it's overly simplistic to, 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 to reduce it to, well, you either understand who you are in Christ or you don't. I think the problem is that we do, but we also see ourselves a certain way, and we exist, we live in the tension. We know the theology, but we live our feelings. We live a different reality. That's the problem, and the problem is that, or or the reason that our insecurities are so hard to shake is because they have legitimate foundations. Sometimes our hang-ups, our insecurities are the fruits of what we have suffered, what we've been through. We have been conditioned to think certain things about ourselves as a result of what we experience. You do not just wake up one day with a complex. You don't. You just don't wake up one day insecure, somewhere along the line, suffering, often at the hands of others, breaks us. It does something to us leave something in us, take something from us. Negative self-perception is often the result of traumas and difficult experiences in life. And she had been the victim of one-way relationships. No wonder she couldn't receive anything from him. No wonder she couldn't take on board the love he had for her. This woman had poured herself out to the detriment of herself. She'd given the best of her vineyards to others. And you know, folks, today the Lord wants to break the power of those strongholds, the power of that insecurity. I believe that. Do you believe that? I don't think God wants us to live in half the gospel story, walking around with a sense of unworthiness, never getting to the grace of the gospel, never getting to the love of God, never getting to the solution for our unworthiness. Amen. I don't want to live in half the story. Do you? I don't want to live there. Verse 7, she says, tell me, you whom my soul loves. She knows God. She has the relationship, but she also has the insecurity. Where you pasture your flocks, where you make it lie down at noon, For why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? What what does she mean? For why should I wonder? What it means is this. She's saying, uh, because in that time a veiled woman was a prostitute. What she's saying is this. Why should I wander like a prostitute among the flocks of your companions? And if this is the picture, she's saying that she doesn't want to live like a loose woman looking for love in all the wrong places places. And it's amazing where we turn to, what we look for as a salve for our insecurities when we have the balm of Gilead. And we look in all the wrong places. Our hang-ups scream at us, you see. They scream at us that we are not enough. And so we constantly self-medicate, entertainment, you know, particularly for men. I'm going to just take three seconds and talk about fubbing. Fubbing is a, wait, everyone's looking at me strange. Relax, it's a real thing. Uh, that fubbing is a term that people have given to husbands who spend all their time on their mobile phone instead of giving attention to their families, their wife and their children. And to me, fubbing is an indication of men seeking escape, seeking a salve, seeking a distraction. I'm a fubber. I fub a lot. And I I identify with it. But maybe you can as well. There is a generation of men who've lost themselves in entertainment because they don't know how to deal with their insecurities. They don't know how to handle 
their hang-ups. And so they've lost them. They've disappeared behind Xboxes and screens and phones. And they've lost any sense of purpose, any sense of direction. They don't know how to serve. They don't know how to socialize. They don't know how to produce anything. Well, I want to tell you tonight, like the Shunammite here, it's time for us to cry out. We have to cry out. Some men fob, some some people it's eating, others career, others it's shopping, others it's gossip, even to numb the feeling. And whatever we turn to for our insecurities, until we cry out for grace, we will be hung up on our hang-ups. And the Shunammite cried out, and the church must cry out, and you must cry out. We need the gospel. We need salvation. She calls for him. She, the shepherd And this is so powerful. She sees him as a shepherd. And she says, show me where you pasture your flock. Where you make it lie down at noon. What amazing language. If you're not in Psalm 23 right now, catch up. Amazing. In other words, she's calling for rest. God, bring me out of insecurity into rest. Bring me out of insecurity and give me the rest my heart desires. I'm tired of looking elsewhere. I don't want to live insecure and sing about truths I don't know for myself. I need you to come and I need you to give me rest, true rest, real rest. I don't want to be hung up on my insecurities and live my Christian life outside the tent, never knowing for myself the intimacy I tell everyone else about and sing about but never experience. God help us all. If you don't think I'm preaching, if if you don't think I'm preaching to myself right now, folks, I don't know what to say to you. This sermon is for me. It's for, we need this. We need this. She wants this. She desires this so she can fully receive the love she knows that's hers. So she can sing with no contradictions. Jesus loves me. This I know. And the King, hallelujah. Hallelujah. He responds, hallelujah. You think the Lord Jesus wouldn't respond to that sort of cry? Lord, I want to know the love you shed your blood to win for me. You don't think he would respond? He's responding here. And there's two things. We're going to look at two things that he says to her in her insecurity. That he also says to us in our insecurity. Verses 8 through 10, let's look at it. He says, if you don't know, Oh, most beautiful among women. Amazing. Follow in the tracks of the flock and pasture your young goats beside the shepherd's tents. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments. Your neck strings of jewels. The first thing he says to her is this. You are beautiful. You're beautiful. I didn't plan on sharing this, but I will share it. Uh, I've started, well, maybe six months ago, I started using, using words of affirmation with my daughter. My daughter is about 14 months old. And what I do is I look at her, and I'm going to say it exactly the way I would say it to her. I look at her and I go, you are beautiful. She's, she can't speak yet. She's got a couple of words. If I ask her, what, what, you know, what does a cow say? She says, mew. <laughs> But she understood what that was. There was a a reaction. There was a reaction to that from her before she was even a year old, before she was even, had words. And folks, don't underestimate the power that God's spoken word over you, his words of affirmation have over you. And he is speaking words of affirmation. He is speaking love. He is saying these things to you. And I love this, the grace of him, the kindness, the compassion. If you don't know, oh, I love it. The wideness of God's grace, the mercy, the compassion. If you're lost, if you, if you don't know, it's okay not to know. What an amazing way that he leads off. The reassurance in it. You see, he tells her exactly where to find him. Jesus isn't hiding. The answer is not a mystery. He is not distant, folks. He's made the way open. He's laid out the path for the church, for his bride. Jesus is still the way, folks. It's never 
been about your merits or your experiences or your traumas. We have to start back at the beginning, at the gospel. It's Jesus, it's the gospel that restores our perspective away from self, back to God. Jesus is the answer for our insecurities. And he speaks to her and he says, he never addresses her insecurities. He speaks to her and he says, you're beautiful. It's something he reiterates throughout the poem. Verse, chapter 5, verse 9, 6, 1. But in verse 15 of this chapter, he says something amazing. He says, your eyes are like doves. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Actually, uh, that like was added later. He's saying your eyes are doves. And that looks like a simile, if you like. Uh, but according to the rabbinic teaching, a bride who had beautiful eyes possessed a beautiful character. They're like an index to her character. So what did he say to her? I'm looking deeper than the trauma. I'm looking deeper than the skin you think is repugnant. I'm looking beyond your surface judgments and assessments of yourself. I always said to my wife that I love her eyes the most because they never age. And they never have. God looks beyond trauma. We make such surface judgments, assessments of ourselves. Yet God says, no, my assessment is different. In Psalms 4 verse 7, he says, oh my love, you are altogether beautiful and fair. There is no flaw nor blemish in you. Hallelujah tonight. That's what he speaks over you and I. He's not interested in our appraisal of ourselves. Thank God tonight. Well, the worst thing is if God actually said, started paying attention to some of our self-appraisals. That'd be a problem. Wouldn't it? But he's not interested. You see, only Jesus desires the unkept vineyard. Only Jesus. Jesus wants me, regardless of the state of my vineyard. Who would want me, you might ask, after life has chewed me up and spat me out? Christ would. After the failed relationships, the abuses, the traumas, long after my looks have faded and my best years are behind me, who would want me? Christ would. Hallelujah. Brennan Manning put it this way, one of the mysteries of the gospel tradition is this strange attraction of Jesus for the unattractive. This strange desire for the undesirable. This strange love for the unlovely. And the key to the mystery is this, of course, Abba, Father. Jesus does what he sees the Father doing. He simply loves who the Father loves. Thank you, Jesus. John 15 verse 3, Jesus says, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken over you. It's amazing tonight. Some of you are looking back at a history full of tarnishes, but blemishes, stains. And yet, according to God's word, you are clean. Because the word of God, Jesus' word over you, the promises are greater than anything your life has. The sum of your mistakes, the sum of your history, the sum of the abuse, the sum of what they did to you or failed to do for you. Thank God tonight. Tonight we need God's perspective. Amen. We do. You see, folks from the right elevation, Balaam, couldn't pronounce a curse on God's people. He had to bless them. From the right perspective, he couldn't but bless the people of God. In Numbers 23, 21, he says this, God has observed no iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord is God. The Lord is God is with him. Some of you need to step back a little bit and look at your life from a bird's eye view to see that God is still with you, that he's kept you. Hallelujah. And a shout of a king is among them. Glory. Glory. Look at this. Numbers 24 verse 5. How beautiful are your tents, Jacob. Your dwelling place, Israel. I am altogether beautiful. Hallelujah. There is no flaw in me. Oh, tonight before I open my mouth to speak about what God has called his own, I will get the right elevation. 
I will get to the right elevation because his word is my perspective. Amen. His word, not my past, not my feelings, but what has been written. Uh, uh, tonight, let us receive that again because the blood has washed away every stain. Hallelujah. Ephesians says we've been washed by the water of his word. The spotless lamb of God became a sin offering for us. He took every spot and stain upon himself and was hung up so that we could be righteous. And this is how God chooses to see us. So this must be my starting point. Hallelujah tonight. He calls me beautiful. And there's a cross where the Son of God was hung up in shame. My shame, my guilt, my spots, my stains. He hung at that cross. That is my truth. That is my truth. That is my vantage point. Thank you, Jesus. The next thing he says to her is this. Stay close to me. Stay close to me. He says, you're beautiful. He says, stay close to me. Follow the trail of my flock, it says in the New Living Translation. I quickly want to bring you to Jeremiah 6. You don't need to turn there, but there's a principle that's going to help us. Jeremiah 6, Jeremiah prophesying to wayward uh, um, Judah. This is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old godly way and walk in it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. There it is again. Hallelujah. But you reply, no, that's not the road we want. You know, Jesus likely quoted Jeremiah 6.16 6, when he said in Matthew 11.29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Hallelujah. You know, there's a significance of crossroads. There's a significance. I, I'd like to look at crossroads tonight as a form of decision making because I want to get a little bit practical here towards the end of this message. Because if we're going to get, if we're going to hang up our hang-ups, we have to look at the decisions we make in a very practical way. We do. Because so many of our decisions actually feed our insecurities. And there's an element of truth tonight that, uh, in the idea that what you feed grows. And if we're going to hang up our insecurities, we actually need grace in our decision-making. Let me tell you what I mean. Many of us are the victims of poor decision-making. You may not see a correlation here, but I'll show you. The choice to compare ourselves, feeding our insecurities, the choice to numb insecurity with trivial things, the choice to expose ourselves to things or people that only deepen our insecurity, the choice to open our mouths and talk about what God is calling us to release to Him, you know, sometimes we feed the event. We feed the, the event that caused the insecurity until it becomes an ongoing experience. And we often find ourselves at crossroads. If you ever thought of that, is this feeding my insecurity? I know someone who will remain nameless who has a pho- used to have a phobia of getting sick. And she kept going on social media reading up on, you know, people who get, got sick and terminal cases and just, you know, uh, you know, all those websites that tell you about symptoms and, you know, if you read them, you've probably got leprosy and scurvy and all the rest of it. It's that kind of thing. We can feed our insecurities. That's the point I'm trying to make. And yet, we're called here to follow the trail of the flock. Let me show you. You know, when you look at the Amplified of Jeremiah 6.16, it says, stop and ask for the ancient paths. Look at this, where the good way is. I love that, where the good way is, and walk in it. There's a principle here for us, folks. If we're going to hang up our insecurities, we need to make better decisions. And how do we do that? The principle is simple. Three Ps. Pause, pray, and proceed. Stop, pause, pray, ask, and proceed, walk. Folks, we need to decide now.
to follow the flock. The ancient paths where the good way is. Amen. Where you'll find true rest. Because what, is, what has been true for 2,000 years is still true. What was true for David when he wrote Psalm 16 is true for you and true for me. In his presence, there's still fullness of joy. Amen. At his right hand, which is Christ, there are still pleasures forevermore. You see, what we need is his presence. Not that thing, not that cycle, not that thing we turn to. We need his presence. We need to pause and consider this, the decision that we're about to make. Maybe we need to log off. Maybe we need to turn the phone off. Maybe the phone, I spoke to somebody the other day who doesn't have his phone in his bedroom because he knows if he has the phone in his bedroom, it'll be the last thing he looks at before he goes to bed at night and the first thing he looks at when he wakes up in the morning. Maybe the phone has to sleep in another room, amen. Maybe it does. And there's this grace that's so amazing. God, give me the grace. I know the ancient paths. I know the way. I know, I know what your word says. Now give me the grace to follow in it. Give me the grace to walk in it. It's not that I don't know. I know, we know. But give me the grace to walk in it. I just need the grace to walk down it. And then help me, Lord, to proceed. Help me to apply the truth to my life. Help me to do that. God, give me the grace in this moment to follow the flock, to choose faith to walk the ancient paths because along there is the good way. Isaiah 30, 21 says this, and when you do, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Hallelujah. And it goes on because what I feed grows. I can feed my insecurities or I can walk along the ancient paths. But when I walk along the ancient paths, when I call on that grace and when I receive that enabling power to walk, I end up always at his tent. Always at his tent. That's always where I end up. That's always. You, 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 you walk in faith even imperfectly. You look to his word even though it's not perfect. You, put your, you plant your feet on the promises of God. You will end up close to him. You will. Hallelujah. And what I feed will grow and and where I choose to pasture matters. And the ancient paths are always as tents. Proverbs 8.34 says this, blessed are those who listen to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. In the NLT, it's joyful, blessed, happy, prosperous, to be admired. Folks, he wants you close enough to his tent so you can hear his heart, close enough to his door, so you can hear his voice, close enough to him, so you can truly know his feelings for you. Amazing. His desire is always intimacy. Hanging up your hang-ups is about renewed intimacy. His word to you tonight is always love. I think it's Songs 2-9. It says that he's brought me into his banqueting table. And his banner over me is love. Hallelujah. And there's power to draw near tonight. There's grace to draw near tonight. Because this isn't some religious duty. Look at verse 9. He says, I compare you, O my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Listen, husbands, particularly men who've been married less than one year. If you go home tonight and refer to your wife as a horse you will be sleeping in the stable. Amen. Don't do it. Even if you're into horses, even if you're into, I don't know, even if, you, even, if it's a, even if you pick a small horse like a Shetland, it's not going to work out for you. But in this context, Solomon's paying her the highest compliment because his mare was his pride and joy. It was the most beautiful and graceful horse in the kingdom. It had been specially selected to draw the king's chariot. And only one horse was good enough for Solomon. Don't even go home tonight, husbands, and say, you're the only horse for me. Don't do it. Don't do it. The meaning of this comparison is obvious. Other women may be fine, but the Shulamite was the only one 
Solomon prized. Isn't that wonderful tonight? That Christ would say that of you. You're my favorite horse. That he would say that of you. That you're my prized possession. Folks, this isn't religious devotion. You do not keep yourself close. Intimacy flows from knowing who you are to the Lord. That's what it is. That's what it's about. You are his prized possession. Zechariah 2.8 says this, For thus said the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Hallelujah. The new living says anyone who harms you harms my most precious possession. Isn't it wonderful tonight that God calls us to stay close because he prizes us above all things? Amazing. And so tonight, I want to finish by reading this to you and to me. He's told us that we're beautiful, but now he's called us to stay close. John uh, 15 verse 9 says this. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I've loved you. Abide in my love. Stay close to me. Stay close to my tent. Hallelujah. Choose the old paths. Take my yoke upon you. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you. Hallelujah. And that your joy may be full. That doesn't sound like having hang-ups to me. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stay close to me. And love your brothers and sisters in Christ as I've loved you. And the conclusion is what? 2 verse 1. Instead of saying she's dark but lovely, she says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Amazing. The journey, the transformation. Her view of herself had remarkably changed. In the first visits at the palace, she was self-conscious and unsure of her appearance, unsure of her worth. But now she says, I'm the rose of Sharon. I'm the lily of the Valerie's, Valerie, Valerie's Valleys. Tonight, before we pray, I want to leave you with this thought. Do not let insecurity keep you from receiving his love. Instead, hang up your hang-ups where they belong, on the cross your shame, your insecurity, your self-doubt on the cross because he's brought you into his chamber. Amen. Pastor Nick, would you pray for us? Thank you. Would you, would you like to stand with me as we pray tonight? We've, I, I'm not going to even add uh, any words to this. It's just been a beautiful, beautiful exhortation from the Word of God and God's great and deep and unchanging love for us. And whatever your struggles are tonight, we've heard a word from the Lord, you know, that we can really and truly trust this word tonight. This is who God says you are. This is who God says I am. And my God, give us the grace to receive it and to live in the victory and all the fruit of that. Uh, wonderful, wonderful declaration over our lives. Father, we just thank you tonight, Lord. God, when we think about it, the famous verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Lord, we thank you that you are full of grace and truth and love, Lord. And We thank you, Lord. We, we, we are loved tonight, Lord. We are cared for. We are cared for. Lord, despite, Lord God, uh, the obvious Adamic failures that we all possess, Lord, you see higher in us, Lord. You see more of us, oh God. You see, Lord Jesus, the completed person, oh God. You see us, Lord, finished. And I thank you tonight, Lord Jesus, that, Lord, you have not abandoned us, even in our dark thinking, even concerning ourselves. Lord, we receive tonight, Lord, what you have sp spoken from this pulpit into our hearts, God. We receive tonight, Lord God, that we are, Lord, called by you, the lily of the valley, Lord, called your beloved, Lord, called, Lord Jesus, Lord, uh, uh, Lord, your, your joy, the apple of your eye, Father. 
And we bless you, Lord. And we want to reciprocate that back to you tonight, Heavenly Father, that you are our lily of the valley, Lord. You are our rose of Sharon, O oh God. Lord, Lord, we want to give back to you, Lord God. All the love that you pour into us, we give back again, Lord, in thankfulness, Lord God. We just thank you that you are our God, that you are our Savior. Thank you so much for rescuing us, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, for coming into our lives, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, for setting your affection and grace upon us, Lord. Thank you for pursuing us, God, in the darkest times, Lord, when we were in all the wrong places, God, when we were, Lord God, uh, Lord, giving ourselves to all the foolish things of this world, O oh God. Thank you that you came and you rescued us and you won us with your love, O oh God. With the, Lord, Lord, with the cords of love, you have, you have drawn us unto yourself, God. Lord, you could have come out of the sky, Lord, and scare the light, the living daylights out of us, God, but you didn't. You won us with your love, Lord, and we thank you tonight. We bless you, Lord, and as we go, Lord, I pray, Lord, that the, these words will go deep into our hearts, Lord. Tomorrow, even when we wake, Lord, they will come back to memory again, oh God, that this is who you say we are, Lord, and that we would have the faith to rise up, Lord God, and to walk in such security, Lord, to hang up our hang-ups at the cross, God, and to walk, Lord, in newness of life, Jesus. I pray, Lord, if there's a man or a woman struggling tonight in who they are that they will leave their struggles right now at Calvary Lord and embrace the truth of the word of God I pray Lord there's just one here tonight that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior Lord that they would bow to knee at the cross Lord and give the hang-ups of all their sin Lord God and leave them at Calvary Lord and receive all the righteousness that came from your death and resurrection thank you Lord for the fellowship of the saints tonight Lord Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us in worship, God. Thank you, Lord, for being amongst us, Lord, for never departing, Lord. We depart and we go home, Lord, but your presence remains with every single one of us, Lord. And we thank you for that, Lord God. We don't leave you, Lord. We carry your presence, Lord, into our nows and into our tomorrows, Lord. And we give you all the praise, Lord, all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise tonight. Praise the Lord. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you for bringing such a beautiful word to all of our hearts tonight. And you know, friends, there's cheese and coffees downstairs, so don't, please don't run away. And if you're new, come and make a friend tonight and come let, let us know who you are. God bless you all. Thank you for coming. The Lord bless you too online. God bless you all.